Nobody said I'm looking. Uh, nobody said uh, uh, I'm looking for a place where I can uh, give forgiveness regularly. My point is, we. We, we have to be very careful about what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the dream wish of community. If you haven't read Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, I highly recommend it. One of the uh, illusions of uh, rabid Protestantism, and I put it that way, is, or, or uh, rabid Protestantism that Protestantism that does not study history is that we think we're the first ones to have ever come up against some of these questions. That's simply not the case. It might be different in the UK because I, I, I would hope it is, but you know the rabid individualism of you know the the Western uh, or the Western American motif is you know everybody thinks they're the first one to the party because they have a Bible. But uh, Bonhoeffer said this, and this is a quote from his book. The person who loves their dream of community will destroy the community. But the person who loves those around them will create a community. I am, after 15 years of organic and house church experience, very, very concerned of the deleterious, toxic, and dangerous effects of Christian idealism and Christian perfectionism. Otherwise, we have a bad experience in situation A. There's a, there's, there's a failure of Christian ideals. There's a failure of human dynamics. And we approach a new endeavor with, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if A, we were in a safe, loving a, a community of authentic human relationships. That is a, a reasonable ideal. But then you come into reality, and reality doesn't match the ideal. And the fact that you're doing house church instead of traditional church doesn't make any difference whatsoever because it's the gap between your dream and your experience just repeats itself over and over and over. And you end up cycling through cycles of disappointment. And it really can slide into cynicism. And you end up being a church of one. Because nobody's quite as good, as quite as smart, or quite as worthy as I am. And for me, Christian idealism and Christian perfectionism are enemies of the cross and a form of legalism. And, uh, excuse me, I just had a phone call come in there. I had to, had to stop. Uh, in my, this is a book I did like 15, 20 years ago. And in it, I have a little poem that I can't give credit. It's not like a poem. It's a statement. I can't give credit because I don't know where it's come from. And I've looked for it and I've, I've heard different people cite different uh, authors and I don't know definitively. But I'd like to read. It's only one, two, three, four, five, six. It's only six lines. But I'd like to read it or say it out loud to you very slowly and ask you to listen very carefully because it's called the actual and the ideal. I'm, I like to I like to read it, comment on it, and then we can have some discussion. There are two things: the actual and the ideal. Maturity sees the ideal, but graciously lives in the actual. That's the first line. To say it again. Maturity sees the ideal, but graciously lives in the actual. Failure accepts only the actual and rejects the ideal. Accepting only the ideal and refusing the actual is immaturity. Don't criticize the actual because you've seen the ideal. That's for perfectionists and idealists. 
but do not reject the ideal because you've seen the actual. That deals with people who never want to change anything. Maturity is the ability to live with the actual and to hold on to the ideal. Many people come into an organic or a house church situation with their dream wish. And their dream wish becomes a destructive element in the community and it becomes um, harmful to other people. It's because they have seen an ideal and they do not have the capacity to exist in anything less than their dream wish. The, their, their, their insight, whatever you want to call it, and how you think church should be done, and that, 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 and all, and all that stuff, it becomes destructive. Bonhoeffer rightly said that the most annoying, and I'm paraphrasing, the most annoying person in the community is a necessity because that annoying person that um, less than ideal situation tempers the triumphalism of idealism that gets a hold of an idea and uses an idea to steamroll people to accomplish some great thing. And Bonhoeffer also said that that annoying person, that, 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 uh, that intolerable situation becomes the only grounds upon which the cruciform life of forgiveness, long-suffering, patience, tolerance, how many times, Lord, 70 in a day, can exist. So that when St. Paul says, Every member is a necessity. That is no joke. I was once in a meeting with, uh, a, and unfortunately, a, a group of people who had a higher opinion of themselves than their reality would dictate in terms of, you know, being spiritually enlightened and progressive. And they're in their, in their 50s and uh, products of the uh, charismatic movement of, of years ago. And, you know, we're mature, blah, 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 blah. And the person who was hosting the meeting says to me, no, if that person over there comes to another meeting, I am never coming to one of, the meet of these meetings again, and you can't meet in my home. And, and it was just personality conflict stuff. But, but here she is, you know, she's, she's, she thinks she's a leader of the organic and house church environment I was in, and she's so immature and that I, I, just out of personality conflict, she's going to cut herself off from another body member. Yes, the person involved was, was overbearing, domineering, but guess what? In a real universe, those things get worked out in the family, in the community. And saying, I'm not coming to another meeting is not the answer. And my point is, that attitude in a home group, in an organic church group, is no different, no better than that attitude in a pew in a building. It's not the building, and it's not the methods of our meeting. It's the values of the, our heart that we bring and what we're trying to, to accomplish. Idealism is what is the, uh, let's face it, when we're dealing with Jesus and we're dealing with the scriptures, there are some ideal things presented, and we're all progressing toward that ideal. We need that thing that says we need to be doing better. We need that thing, that, thing, that sound, because that's the, uh, the, the, the impetus for forward growth. But we also need the thing that says this is reality, and we are going to develop transformative character in this reality. Instead of mutually recriminating judgments about how far short we're falling from the, from the ideal. Um, 
I've come to the conclusion in my own, my own life regarding pursuit of that loving, authentic, relationally real, safe, that's a big one, trustworthy community boils down to this. And again, I only have my American and th this uh, rabid, subjective, private piety, private um, spirituality to deal with. I don't know how bad it is in the UK, but in, in the US and in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible Belt in the US, it's this. I've got my salvation. I've got my Jesus. I've got the Bible and I've got the Holy Spirit and I don't need you and I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do. I don't need any, my spirituality is just fine. I think that is anti-Christ, anti-incarnational, anti-ecclesial, and it's a, it's a bone-numbing ignorance about what it means to be in the people of God with other people. Here, here, here's here's my, my main point. Until I view another person as a necessity to working out my salvation with fear and trembling, I don't think how we do church matters one bit. I'll just use Jim and I as an example. If Jim and Lorraine are optional accessories to my private spirituality we are fooling ourselves to even let the word community run off of our lips it's a joke until i recognize the dimensions of the graces of god that reside in them and understand that not only can i not be perfected but I can't know God without Jim and Lorraine. We are still kidding ourselves about the advanced spirituality of doing an organic church. We're kidding ourselves. There are different apostles in the scriptures for different reasons. They have different emphases. And because of Paul's dominance, you know, people tend to form Pauline perspectives of doctrine. But look, John said this. He that does not love does not know God. That means my knowledge of God is intimately bound up with other human beings. And I come from, again, from a 45, 50, going on close to 47, going on 50 years of charismatic stuff. And, and the emphasis of meeting Jesus in the worship service. Oh, you know, the presence, the presence. I've written a whole book about bad theology, about the presence of God. I was raised and conditioned in a subjective presence that comes and goes and etc. cetera, old, old, old covenant stuff and, you know, praise and worship and creating an atmosphere. I raised and all that stuff. But at the bottom, at the end of the day, it was about me and Jesus. I had no teaching whatsoever of the incarnational element. And so the worship service then became an exercise in narcissistic codependency for a, a spiritual rush. And for those that were a little more intellectually inclined, we got our rush from a great word. Oh, you know, the brother brought a great word. Ooh, that was such an anointed word. Ooh, you know, all, all that stuff. But still... The other people were accessories to my private spirituality. And my, my point for today is, if we, in my opinion, if we don't get a shift of thinking on some very fundamental Christian truths, basic apostolic Christian truths, I don't think it's spiritually progressive at all to change the venue, the form, 
the structure and the methods of how we do a meeting. I would rather be part of an institutional church, A, that isn't anti-sacramental. That's another conversation I don't have time for to get into today. But the, the, the anti-sacramentalism in reaction to different Roman and Catholic and Protestant debates from the 16th century, which I'm not interested in rehashing, has very deleterious effects. The very, the very essence of the Eucharist, for example, it's fundamentally a statement about our necessity of one another in this one loaf that I, I can't get with just me, Jesus, and the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. I, I, it, you can't do it. So I think we need a deep um, theological renewing, a renewing of the mind, a spiritual renewing, that the people that the Lord has put me in relationship with. I, I need to view them as necessities. It was easier in the early first century church because if you're living in a, in a town with 200 people, let's say two, let's take Nazareth, roughly 200 people. You're going to know everybody. And when you're sick, there's no, there's no NIH. There's no welfare system if your husband has broken his leg and he can't work the only people there are going to be your relatives and the community to take care of you we need to understand that when the scriptures were written that's the atmosphere and when the when the when the New Testament church came together as a people of God, yes, there were Jew-Gentile problems. I get it. I understand the curse against the Nazarenes in the synagogues in 8083 or whatever it was. There were problems from the beginning. But that sense of each member being a necessity was just daily. Let's take when you get God elderly. Listen, there, there was no state-run retirement program. Who took care of the elderly? The family. And so, therefore, every gift represented, in, it, it, it was necessary. So I think it's a mistake to talk about ecclesia and ecclesial terms and, and, and uh, 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 ecclesia life. And what does it mean to be ecclesia when we project and we're still carrying these Western sensibilities of... Uh, we're together because these are my friends. We agree. We like one another. We see one another. We sing a few songs. We pray for another and we go home. But at the end of the day, you are an accessory. I am an accessory. And I don't view you as having provision of Jesus Christ for me. I think that latter thing has to be established amongst the people before anything meaningful happens. And that goes against not just American sensibilities of individualism, but even the foundations of Western culture, you know, Descartes and, and Rodin and all these others. So we have some philosophical inertia working against us. And at the risk of repeating something that I, I might have said last time, because the question says, well, well, how do I know? How, how, do, how do I know? Where do I find these people? How do I know? Well, that begs the question of proximity, doesn't it? I have to be with people. Jesus preached to multitudes on the hills. But when it came time for him to invest his life into others, it says this, he went away into a high mountain and he prayed all night for those who were to be given to him. His, the relationships in which he was authorized to execute transformative interactions, discipleship, better better translated apprenticeship those were specific assignments from his father 
And then at the end of his life, he says, I have kept those you gave me. My premise is, if the second person of the Godhead in the flesh, if the incarnate word of God had to pray all night about the people to whom he was to open his soul, I would think we it would behoove us to take that matter very seriously. Because here's the big finish for me. I think it is impossible to live out what I started with today if we do not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have been assigned to one another relationally. Because if Father has created the relationship, I believe with all my heart, the power, the grace, everything necessary to make that the best possible relational dynamic exists. And there's a chance that we could live out a cruciform existence with each other. But if we're just mates and we're just getting together because we like the preaching or because we have common interests, when it gets close, when it gets we need to talk to the brother, there's nothing there that can sustain the stress of imperfect human relationships and the dream wish crashes. I believe we are to be kind, we're to love everybody, to share with anybody that wants to listen. But when it comes to building a the fabric of a community, it takes more than a good idea. I love what the, one of the other brothers said. Listen, we prayed to the best of our ability. The people I'm with, this is what we feel. This is what we're going to do. That is a good and a safe place to start. But the fabric of community is not a rhetorical or philosophical Christian ideal. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. Let's go do that. There's a price tag that comes with pursuing real love and real community. And I I'd like to work the uh, fabric analogy a little bit more, and then I'll probably wind it up. I don't know how it is in the UK, if this term makes sense, but when you're dealing with fabrics or with linens, there's something called the thread count. And if you buy cheap linen, it has a low thread count. Otherwise, it, let's just say it has um, 20 threads per uh, uh, square. I'll go, I'll, I'm going to go English, not, uh, not metric. Just forgive me on that. But uh, 20 threads per square inch. Well, that would be a terribly low thread count. Conversely, if I'm, if I'm uh, dealing with a fine Egyptian linen, say, let's say it has 200 threads per inch. That's a very high quality uh, piece of fabric. If I take that 20 thread count fabric and I hose it down and I put a three or four kilo stone on that fabric, what's going to happen to that fabric? It is going to break because the bonding of the threads, listen carefully, are not tight enough and not close enough to withstand stress. Conversely, if I buy the high quality linen, with 200 threads per, per, per inch, and I wet it and I put a two kilo stone on it, what's going to happen? That stone is going to sit there, listen carefully, because the number, the intimacy, the closeness, and the weave of the threads is enough 
to withstand the stress. Paul made a remarkable and stunning statement in Colossians chapter 2, and by the grace of God, I'll finish with this. If you ask a typical charismatic like myself, where is the anointing experience? There'll be one of two answers. If you're a praise and worship person, you say, oh, man, dynamic praise and worship. Oh, you know, when the presence of God fills, oh, the anointing. If you're on the intellectual side, you'll say, oh, you know, so-and-so brought the word that like I've never heard before. It was so anointed. In all my years of charismatic, I've never heard anybody say what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2. He said this. And this relates to the thread count metaphor. That being knit together in love, you may come to understand the deep mysteries of Christ. Notice, he didn't say they were known by carrying on singing for 45 minutes and working yourself up into a frothy sweat. He didn't say they were known, they're going to be known by better exegetical preaching. Being knit together in love is related to our ability to understand Jesus. That's why Jim is a necessity to me. That's why that other person on the other side of the room is a necessity. And this is offensive to private, individualistic, subjective Protestantism. It's offensive. Here's the offense. I cannot know and experience God without that other person. That's what the scriptures say. So, if folks feel called or led to pursue alternate forms of gathering, my prayer is that it is not a reactionary move. My prayer is that it is not in pursuit of a dream wish. My prayer is that it is not in judgment against others who don't share the same conviction. And my prayer is that they wouldn't even start until they have conversations about these things. Because my experience has been you are just delaying the inevitable, which is another disappointing experience. I cannot tell you the number of people my age and 10 or 15 years younger who are just going around the mountain of disappointment for the hundredth time. And they, they become more cynical, more judgmental more damaged, more dangerous because their dream, dream wish is not in alignment with Jesus and his cross. Wherever other human beings are involved, the ideal and the actual are held in tension by the a high thread count of love. And that's it for me today. Thanks, Steve. That's uh, interestingly enough, um, listening to what you've been saying today. And uh, fellas, please, if you've got questions, so if you've got anything you want to ask, uh, that's fine. Um, I find some of you may know I, I pastored a church for a, a good number of years, um, and that's how I met Steve on our annual winter retreat. Um, yeah, I remember that all my life. Yeah, I, I really. Um, and and they were good. They, we had great times as, as church go, but I, I found myself becoming very cynical 
Um, so I was, I can put my hand up and say, I've been one of those damaged pastors. I've been, you know, abused by uh, Christians um, in, in, a, in a number of ways and probably done my fair share of traditional um, church type abuse myself. You know, not, not knowingly, just following the scheme of things, following what you're meant to do um, in, in, a, in a role uh, in a in a standard Pentecostal church to the point where yesterday actually I caught myself doing it again I put on a men's breakfast or I was part of a men's breakfast I should say I was doing all the food um, and I made the statement to everybody okay guys when you come and get your food two pieces of bacon two pieces of sausage because I know what you Christians are like you take no. more than you need often and and that actually, I tarred a room full of men with a brush that relates to two people. Come on, Jim. Mm -mm. You know, so I, 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 I'd already judged the entire room full of Christian brothers that they were going to try and take more than they needed. And so I had to dictate to them the rules before we started. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I, 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 I value wisdom that speaks into times like that in, in, in my life. And I, I thank the Holy Spirit for pointing things out to me as difficult as they are sometimes. But I think it is, it is very easy to fall into cynicism mm -hmm. and judgment of other Christians um, if we're in this place of seeking. And I know because I have been there and, and could continue there. Um, while you guys are forming your questions, I would just like to say, Steve, can you... Because I know this is a statement that you've used a number of times, and I don't know how this might be a subject for another time. The cruciform life. Mm. How quickly right. can you define the cruciform life? Not not very, but I'll try. <laughs> it simply it simply means to walk the same way Jesus walked. It means that we love and we forgive our enemies, and we pray for our enemies. We don't judge them. We forgive seventy times in a day. We live a, a cruciform Christ-like existence. So, uh, I'll make one statement, and if the Lord will help me, one, one analogy. The summation of the cruciform life to me is Jesus' statement from the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jim, let me apply to your honest story just a minute ago. What would have been the cruciform response? To those brothers that take too much. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. It is hard for us to believe that when people do those things that they really don't know what they're doing. Think about our dear Lord. He's being crucified. And at one level, you could say, well, of course they knew what they were doing. He was conspired against. They plotted to kill him. And yet Jesus says they didn't know what they were doing. It's, and this is where I can't go too deep, but it's actually a reordering of the cosmos, and it's the beginning of the reordering of the new creation of human being. And that would be a conversation for another day. But let me give you another example of what the cruciform life looks like. Okay, for those of us that come from apostolic or, 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 or charismatic backgrounds, you know, apostle this, apostle that, apostle this, prophet that. You know, all this title stuff and honorific titles and, and all that and all this stuff ad nausea. So Paul is relating to a church that he planted that are ready to give him the boot. They're, they're going to boot him. They're kicking him out. Because why? Uh, we like his letters, but his preaching is lousy. So 2 Corinthians becomes Paul's very uh, uh, apologetic defense of his relationship with him. And he says things like this. He says, look, I might not be an apostle to others, but I am to you because of our relationship. And so then he gets to, to uh, 12, chapter 12. This, and when this hit me, uh, it changed my life, and it, it gives me no reason to regularly repent and pray. Now, Paul says this to people who are mistreating him, not recognizing his ministry, ready to give him the boot, 
lying about him behind his back, he says this to those people. I will therefore spend and be spent by you, though I am loved the less for it. Spending is taking my wallet and I decide what comes out of my wallet. Now, it's good to spend for others. But the cruciform life is when I open the wallet and I say, take whatever you want. And then it takes it up another level. And I'll let you do it even if I'm loved the less for it. That's cruciform living. Now, that is a tall order. That is a high order. But it is exactly what Jesus did on the cross for us. And in my opinion, that is one of the key definitions of genuine apostolic ministry. I'm not going to get into all that today. But the ethic applies to all of us. And that's why what that makes a story of that lady that got so offended. Her response is so antichrist. It's because that annoyance, I am not, I'm not willing to have my sensibilities of relational propriety even rubbed the wrong way by you, let alone spend anything for you, let alone be spent by you, and don't even think of not rewarding me appropriately with either money, finances, affection, or status for the way I responded so wonderfully toward you. So the cruciform life is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think, and I, it's hard for me not to preach this because, Jim, you've opened up one of my favorite topics. I think that sentence is one of the most profound cosmological statements made by any human being on the planet. I think it is the beginning of the restructuring. It's the release in the earth of the true Logos. It is the incarnation of the Logos. It is the revelation of the heart of the Father. And that's why, when, in my opinion, when we do Bible study, we don't start with Genesis. We start with that moment. Because that moment is the definition of what the new creation order looks like. And a local church is supposed to be the incubator of the new creation life. That's good. Thank you. Anybody else got anything they would like? Any questions? Um, yeah. Tina. Um, just an honest question, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. To develop, using your analogy of thread count, to develop relationships with that level of thread count, is there some kind of limit to how many of those relationships you can form? In my opinion, yes. Yeah. The way I say, love everyone, right? Unmerited goodwill. Teach anyone. But I am finite. Mm. That's one of the things that uh, sometimes Christians are not very good. I'm sorry if I interrupted you, but I, if you didn't even get your question out fully. Would you like to finish your question? I'm sorry. I'm just so no, eager. No, that, no that, was, that was the question, very simply, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, things that human beings in the Adamic state are not very good at dealing with is our finiteness. We are finite, and we're not good at everything. And that, those two things and the fear of death are three of the things that make us human. No, I can't be all things to everybody. I am not called to. That's why I have to know. Myself and that other person, we have to know. And I have done several times, and I have to know myself. I have to know my strengths and my weaknesses. Because here's what can sometimes happen. And I know you guys have experienced this, particularly maybe those of you, Sean, myself, a couple of other brothers that are my age. 
People can be drawn to the grace of God in us when it functions rather to, than to who we really are as human beings. So they respond and they, and they make a bond with that grace rather than at, under divine assignment by Father. Well, guess what? My grace might not be very suitable for that person or for that person at that time. And that's why we have a many member diverse body of different graces. And I've told many people, so they say, Steve, you know, will you mentor me, blah, 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 blah. That, so I so say, say, first of all, I don't operate that way. I said, those things are mutually recognizable between uh, two people in community with the Holy Spirit. You don't need to talk about it. You don't need to program it. You don't need to prescribe it. It will be self evidential It will give self-evidence to itself of being real as you spend time together. But I've also said, look, I know what I have ultimately will not be good for you long term. But I know another brother or I know another sister. Man, you need to talk to them. You need to go have lunch with them as fast as you can because I believe your provision in Christ is locked up in their grace. So I, I really take seriously as a holy calling the, even an opportunity like this to, to deposit things into another human being's soul. I think one of the brothers was talking about teaching and prophecy and all that saying, I think we are far too casual far too flippant about opening our big yappers to anybody just thinking they need to hear what we have to say. I believe it is a holy thing to, to, trans, to put transformative effect on another human being. That's why I gave the analogy about Jesus. He would, he would didache, he would teach anything. But he didn't trans try to transform everybody. Discipleship is transformation. And I think just because they you know, person X comes to the meeting and likes to listen to me carry on. Oh, well, you know, they're getting it. No, we need to know because it's a holy thing to put my hands on another human being's life representing the name of Jesus. I think we need to we all need to take it far more seriously and far less damage would be done to people both by ignorance and malice. If we, we understood that not everybody is mine. Imagine, imagine a quick, quick analogy. Thank you for asking a good question. First of all, it's a great question. Uh, imagine you're in a neighborhood, uh, kids are playing in the street and uh, your neighbor's boy is uh, behaving inappropriately. Uh, 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 let's say he's dropping his pants and showing his private part to the neighborhood. And you rush out there and you grab your neighbor's boy and you grab him and you start, you know, whatever you think his discipline is, is worth. Why would that not be appropriate? Because he's not your son. You can stop the harmful behavior, you can go out there and tell that boy, pull up your knickers. But you have no authority to put transformative effects on that son by discipline, chastisement, and training because he's not your boy. And yet we come to the church and we think everything with a heartbeat and two legs is is a target for my wonderful ministry. And then we wonder why our churches don't work and our, and our local communities don't work. We didn't ask God. We didn't pray about it. We didn't talk about it. We're just together. I'm the pastor. You're, you've come in to listen. And like Jim said, just doing what we've known to do. So you have asked a keystone question in my opinion that has to be addressed because I guarantee you everything will be great until it's not great and those of us that have done any ministry know, know what I'm about to say when people are being thrilled by your grace 
things are great. But when you have to get down into the mud of their lives and say, this behavior cannot continue. It's, oh, you're harsh, you're judgmental. You don't understand the grace of God. Who gave you the right to talk to me that way? You have no business. You know, Jesus hasn't told me that. And I don't understand how you feel. You can tell. You cannot have a functional community with that kind of mindset. That uh, my, my uh, one liner is that is not workable material. Conversely, if if you know you have been given to one another by God Almighty, you are going to approach those those interactions very differently. The one bringing the transforma transformation re demand request, I want to say, is going to handle you handle the other person for what that other person really is. This I'm going to use some in, inadequate language, but that person belongs to another lord you're not the lord you need to treat that person as another lord's property per se but if you have been duly commissioned by that lord to bring chastisement you are off you're an authorized parent and then the person on the receiving end of it understands that you, th that you love them because you've spent enough time with them You've been with them in, in dark moments. You've given yourself for them the way that Paul did to the Corinthians. So their, their fear factor of, of them going to do damage to you is, has dropped because you have proven your love to them and they are more apt to receive what you have to say. I use the analogy of the brother with the overwhelming personality. And I've known that brother for 15 years. And let me tell you something. That brother's a load. And I've and 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 he he's been a load on me, and people people would say to me, Steve. We would have given up on that guy decades. Steve, we don't understand how you can put up with that guy. You know how I could put up with that guy, because we were assigned to one another. I was empowered and called by grace for that man, and he was empowered and called by grace for me. Can I? I'm sorry for long-winded answers, you guys. Honestly, I'm not normally this long-winded, so I, there must be some hunger drawing it out of me today. This is what I'm about to say is very important. I've known that brother for 15 years. We have never had one conversation about authority. We've never had one conversation about submission. We've never had one conversation about headship. We've never had one conversation about government. We've never had one conversation about honor because where love under divine assignment is empowered, all those conversations are unnecessary because you get with assigned and empowered love makes all those things happen without conversation. He was open to me and I didn't violate him. And one of the kindest things he said to me, he said, Steve, I've come to see that you love me enough to give me enough room to make my own mistakes, even when I don't do what you've asked me to do. See, that builds credibility in a person. And then and I had another person, and excuse me for bragging, but it's just it's just it sounds like bragging, but it's just my experience. And I share this one last time. And I had one brother say to me once, this is a younger man, like 20s, early 20s, clearly has a chip on his shoulder towards the church, church authority, church leadership, huge chip on his shoulder. And that's one reason why he's out institutional church, et cetera. And, and, and I said to him, I said, then why are you talking to me? He said this, Steve, because you have proven that you are not in it for yourself which leads to the issue of trust. Otherwise, by the way I had conducted myself in front of this young person for 10 or 15 years, I had earned the right to be trusted. We think because we got a revelation from the word that everybody needs to listen to us. Not true, not true. Thank you for an excellent question. Sorry for a very diverse long answer.
Excellent answer. Right, thank you very much for that, Steve. Powerful. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> may I just uh, show a, a, an example with what Stephen shared? Uh, I just want to see if I can make a, a comparison of this in any regard. I and mean, please, Steve, or anyone who may think this might not be a good illustration. Um, I have two two brothers in my life who um, I think the way they relate with me when it comes to relationship correction and stuff like that, um, I'm weary to discern whether it's um, whether it's me with the issue or the other individual. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> I have one brother who uh, is very similar to what you're saying, Steve, about the guy who said that. You know, you don't, you have that respect for the person that you will allow them to make mistakes and be okay with it. Um, I have a brother when I'm making mistakes of being flawed, he will, he will only come and talk to me when he feels led by the Lord. Um, whereas this other brother um, only comes to speak with me when he wants to bring a correction. Or it won't be like, hi, how are you? You know, I only get a phone call or anything when he sees something I need to change or something I need to stop or something I need to... Um, and he kind of feels it's his duty to kind of, well, the Bible says, you know, we should be accountable to every, we need to be accountable to everyone. Uh, we need to be accountable to each other. And so the Bible says this, and this is what you need to do. And I have Just kind of, of real, quick, real quickly and let you finish. The yes. Bible never uses the word for accountability. We can talk about that when you're done. But the Bible does not say that. But go ahead and finish your, your, your statement. Uh, I, I normally hear when the Bible says about confess your sins to one another. That's what they yeah. normally use. Um, but I was like, oh, I, I remember something you said, Steve, a while back in one of your talks when you said about if you've got to start using accountability and I am the authority and all that, love is lacking. Um, and I got to a point where I said, bro, like, I appreciate you giving me advice. I came to you for advice on certain things. But please, like, can you stop? And he just kept going. And I just felt like I kind of now lost my trust and respect for that person. Um, I kind of just don't want to pick up that phone anymore because um, I'm just like, you're, you're like, there's boundaries here. If I'm telling you no, I'm not interested, but you keep mm. pounding. And we, a few of us have spoken to the guy, but he just, he's one of the leaders in a group, a mm. fellowship, one of the leaders. And I, I kind of try to speak to him about it. Like, be careful, bro, because the way you're running it, it might become, might become a bit caught. You might, he feels the responsibility to, get involved with every single person and tell them what to do and what they should be doing. And I'm just like, no. Whereas this other brother I have, he's very soft. He's gentle. He's not, he'll correct me in love. Like, bro, I love you. Like, I think you need to change this, but he won't. And if I don't, he backs off, you know? So I don't know if, yeah, that's just a couple of examples that I kind of have to deal with. And I don't know if it was my issue, if I was being pr proud where I wasn't trying to take correction or advice. Or if he was in the wrong, if that makes any sense. Well, it's a, it's a very common scenario, Kyle. In this, and in my opinion, the second analogy that you, you described is dysfunctional on all levels. And uh, probably too much to unpack today, but let me, let me say this. Uh, there's no police department in the kingdom. There are, there are fathers, mothers, sisters, and brothers. There are, there are old people middle-aged people and beginners I'm, I'm paraphrasing first john and anything that is done through the modality of policing another's behavior thinking that that is helping them transform is just misguided it's misguided poorly implemented you like to give people the benefit of the doubt. You hope that they're motivated, honestly. Often they aren't. Uh, it's projection of their own insecurities, some weird reverse psychology about being superior to the, to the other person. That's why all the things I've said earlier today are so important, Kyle. They have to be in place. See, because I don't operate that way. Listen, I, I surround myself with brothers and sisters that I know and I trust, and they know and trust me. When they speak, I say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I am going to take what you say. I'm praying about it. Then we're going to get together again. We're going to talk about it. And if we don't agree, we're going to bring somebody else into the conversation because I value you too much to blow off what you're saying. 
But when I got one of these guys that just likes to police everybody else's behavior, I won't even let them tell me what the weather is. They don't care for my soul. They don't. They don't care for my soul. They, they, they just want to conform my behavior. Lay down your life for me for a few years, Bubba, before you, you, know, you start trying to tell me you know, everything that's wrong with me. My God, I'm introspective enough as it is. I know I'm, I'm half suicidal half the time. I'm, I'm so in tune to my own defects. I don't, need, I don't need another person telling me what an idiot I am. I'm pretty well in tune to that. But if, and, and this is a great lead into prophetic ministry. Genuine New Testament prophetic ministry is not just diagnostic of defect. Genuine prophetic ministry does diagnose defect and empower a transformative pathway to alternative behavior. If you're just diagnosing the defect, you are not functioning in prophetic ministry. You're just a professional critic. And anybody can do that. Anybody who spends any time with human beings can do that. Forget about church stuff. So uh, excellent question, Kyle. Very common experience. Uh, probably everybody on this call has had something like, like that. And again, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. But brothers, let me tell you, I've been at this long enough now that there's some really unwell poorly taught, my, my word is relationally dysfunctional, biblically literate to a degree, but relationally dysfunctional people who do a lot of damage to other body members. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Kyle, for sharing. Um, just before we end, fellas, um, and I don't want to end prematurely, I'm just going to um, just send a message. It's my mobile number. If you want to take my mobile number and then just zap me back a text saying, this is Kyle, this is Tina, this is John, whatever. Uh, Dave, I've got yours. Would it be valuable if I created a little WhatsApp group so that, you know, in the meantime, if, you know, uh, you wanted to communicate um, together, we can do, um, you know. Uh, and also, if we're in vicinity, like Kyle, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in London uh, at some point in the next couple of months, you know, we could maybe link up and have a cup of coffee somewhere. You know, I've got no agenda. I'm just, I'm coming down to London for a, a posh tea and staying for a few days with my family, you know, but there's only so much you can do with your family before you get bored of them. So uh, my wife's gone. She can't hear me now. Um, so, <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, anything else fellas that you want to say or share? I've got, I've got a follow-up question to my earlier one, if I may see. Please. Uh, and I think it's more of an observation on my part than a question, but I just wanted to get your take on it. And, it's, and that is, do you find that there are um, times and seasons to some of these relational dynamics whereby uh, they are perhaps more... Um, in focus for a certain length of time and then drift away and then they come back and so on and so forth and you kind of pick up where you left off with some people and, but there's always that sense of life in it um would that be fair to say yes in my opinion 100 percent. one of the things that i do not agree with in is that if you have one of these sort of father-son relationships i've actually written a little book on it i don't even like to use the term Paul only uses the term in regards to three people that he actually led to the Lord. That's another conversation. But, but the idea that something has to be forever is just not, not the case. Life has ebbs and flows, right? The issue, the issue is that bond, the bond in Christ that's established in season A, is always recoverable again at any other point. That can't be lost. Right, because love never fails, and the kingdom cannot suffer loss. So, time, continuity of time, doesn't necessarily play into it. But, but just like when we grow, the nature of the that bond can take on different expressions, different flavors, different dimensions. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, 
if my, uh, my, my, my child is three years old and, and we're, we're at a bonfire and the child is running into the bonfire, I'm not going to sit there and talk to them and explain the physics of combustion and, you know, how oxygen is consumed and how many BT. I'm just going to grab the child and say, don't go near the fire. Because their capacity to engage me with my level of understanding is limited by their childhood. But the child grows. And eventually they're sitting by the bonfire and they're actually kind of amazed. Th that's the time. Then I talk to them about the, the physics of combustion and energy. So, so the, the, the relationship is always there, but the dynamic of it is, is, can be very different and very seasonal. I like to say it this way. I, I don't know if you are on the call last time. Yeah. But my, but my swinging door on the heart analogy, you know, easy in, easy out. People come in, I don't expect anything, and people can go out. They move, they take a different job, they go in a different direction. They, it, it's okay. We, we, we allow each other in and out freely without these rigid, and that's why I don't believe in accountability, because that whole accountability thing, it's like um, driving in the car with a bobby in the back. Of course, you're not going to speed, Be, but the minute the bobby's gone, you're speeding again, because there's nothing transformative in it. It's policing. Mm. So, so, no, I don't want that, but, and, 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 and it doesn't mean that you're my eternal bobby now, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know, for the rest of your life, you're accountable to me. I mean, I've heard that stuff taught. You know, I'm apostle so and so, uh, and you know, you need to uh, you need to be accountable to me. No, not really. <laughs> um, I, I I really appreciated you saying the um, the two way nature of it because that's something that I've kind of stumbled with in the past. Uh, particularly as a, I'm an associate pastor, um, I've been for the last six years. So, in in that capacity as a pastor, it's very, very easy to fall into the trap that I'm the one that's meant to be contributing right. to this flow of life, and they're the ones that are supposed to be receiving, like you said, the right. benefit by wisdom, whatever that's supposed to mean. You know, <laughs> uh, but I found that the, the relationships that have that genuine touch of God and life aren't like that at all it's they, they are there's this exchange that's going on yes that I, yeah. I can't even describe i can't yeah. describe it you just experience yeah. it and really you benefit from it yeah but there's some, there's something that happens in connection of an exchange and, yeah. and they're, they're precious they really are it really is and let me work the swinging door analogy again too you know the old cowboy western where the the cowboy comes through the swinging door into the saloon Look, at, if I have a swinging door in my heart and you come up to my door and you're covered in mud and carrying guns and you got a, 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 a dead skunk hanging up, it's go, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> whoa, you're, you're leaving the guns outside, you're, keeping, you're taking your dirty boots outside and you're definitely dropping that skunk. So it's not like there aren't boundaries for self-protection. You know, every metaphor has its own limits. It is perfectly legitimate that's part of the prayer and assignment process. Is this person even safe? Because if this person has an agenda, if this person's intent is to harm me, I'm not talking about normal human failure. You know, we all fail. When a, I'm talking about somebody with malice and they're, and they're coming under the guise. And if I let them in my home, they're going to rape my children and, and, and steal my stuff. No, that, I'm putting a lock on the swinging door. So we do get to establish appropriate boundaries based on discernment, which is a gift that most people don't exercise, and, and your conversations with other people. You know, so on, so on, so on. So, I mean, what do you what do you think? You know, I'm getting some, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm not feeling, when we get those feelings, we need to talk to somebody. Do you know I met that brother once? I had coffee with him. He didn't do anything. He didn't say anything. 
but my my skin was crawling the whole time that we were having lunch. We need to pay attention to those things and have a community so it doesn't just de- degenerate into eternal suspicion. See, if that thing is not governed and moderated by the multitude of many voices, it can degenerate very rapidly into a judgmental culture of suspicion. But on the other hand, if we don't exercise it, that's where we end up getting damaged. Yeah, my wife's very good at that discernment, not so much me. me <laughs> I've learned too. to listen to her. Totally she, get it. Her senses go off. I, I pay attention. I waited too long to figure that out about my wife. I, I have never known her to be wrong when she when she's in her game, hundred percent accuracy. Of course, and I'm so naive, and and we have those conversations, and I'll say to her, I said, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll say, "Well, what has he ever done?" And she said, "Wait, you'll see." And I, I get better. I'm better at it than I was twenty years ago, but twenty years ago, you, 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 I just never could get. So I totally get it. I'm I'm too naive, and uh, she's she's as sharp as a tack on that thing. And when she's and like you said, if she runs up the flag, brother, you better listen, or your ship's headed for the rocks. Yeah. <laughs> Very good analogy. Yeah. Thanks for that, Steve. Thank you, Tino. It's an excellent point. Brilliant. Is is there anything anybody else would like to ask at this at this juncture? Um, in which case, Lorraine sent her apologies. She's she she tried to stay, but uh, uh, she's been helping my son, who's bought a new house. Um, so she's been decorating uh, this afternoon as well. So she was. Uh, she just said she's really tired. So uh, it's nothing personal. Um, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time out to come and share uh, with us. Do appreciate it. I, I'm really actually quite heartened. Um, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, I mean, I know John and I've seen John and I've heard and I've benefited from, from John's ministry over the years. Dave, definitely a connection. And for yourself, Tino and, and Kyle, you know, I, I've been heartened that there's a connection. It, it feels like your friends as I, even though this is only a, over a, a computer screen um, and, you know, I appreciate that, that nudge, that unction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not getting my spider sense isn't tingling. So <laughs> uh, hopefully we can uh, we can maybe you know just just see where God is taking us all really. Mm. And please know um, that you know uh, I'll, I'll be praying for your for your situations and praying for you all. Um, and you know would appreciate that that in return. Um, you know, uh, as as we as we go through these coming weeks, months, how, whatever it is, Steve, would you f- close <laughs> the traditional ways to close with prayer? But if you would would just seal the deal for us, I'd really yep. appreciate that. Father, I thank you for every brother and sister, but mostly brothers today. I think who showed up for today. I pray that which is profitable for each of them at their moment in time in this life would take root in their soul. I pray that difficult to swallow will be meditated upon we thank you for the blessing of being called by your name lord we want to walk worthy without condemnation we want to revel in your love and grow in your character at the same time amen thank you lord amen Amen. Uh, yeah, just 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 one final tiny analogy, and then we're, we're, I'll leave you guys to Sunday night. I, I, you may know I've worked in prisons, uh, prison ministry, and uh, one of the things I used to do was I used to get the guys to hold hands, and uh, I'd say, "Right, guys, I'm going to uh, I'm going to get through you," and uh, they would hold on as hard as they could. But I'll tell you, what, I could put a shoulder down, and even some of the big lads, and they would try their best. I could push through and tear the hands apart. And I'd say, okay, guys, now link arms. And they'd knock their elbows together and take an extra grasp. I, they'd bind on like a rugby scrum. There's no way I was getting through that. And it was just an analogy that I used to, you know, use with the guys in the jail. Guys, bind on. Bind on in prayer. Bind on together. Bind mm-hmm. on in love. You know, it's that weave image, isn't it? And, and then... 
the naysayers, the enemy, all the all the fuss and bother isn't going to get through. So you know, uh, fellas, I want to bind on with you and bind yeah, on man. in love and bind on in fellowship. And uh, you know, bless you. Bless you guys. Bless you. See you guys. Uh, next month, God will. I'll see you soon. See you in the. See you in four weeks or a month or yep. whatever it is. <laughs> Great.